Tonight, the Liberals battle on multiple fronts. While the Conservatives walk into a Winnipeg store. If he wants a campaign to help, he should help the people. With a week to go, Rosemary leads our coverage of the fight for your vote. Chaos in northern Syria and deep concern in the region and world capitals. A powerless Thanksgiving for many in Manitoba. And a candid conversation with Celine Dion. The best is yet to come. On the old songs, life after Renee, and becoming an internet icon. This is The National. Well, this holiday Monday offered little rest to the major party leaders. If anything, with just one week of campaigning left, they were running hard to whip up momentum. Tonight, the polls would suggest some sort of minority government scenario, and that closeness seems to be reflected in the tactics of the main contenders. And, Rosa, you're following what's shaping up to be a really tight race. Yeah, and potentially a very long night on Monday, Adrian. Seven days to go now, and it is very close between those two frontrunners. A tension that was seen on the trail today as comments by NDP leader Jagmeet Singh yesterday didn't seem to fit quite as comfortably. David Cochran explains. Jagmeet Singh started a campaign conversation about forming a coalition with the Liberals, and he may have started it by accident. It all started Sunday with a simple answer to a simple question. If the Conservatives win more seats, will you still try to form a coalition government with the Liberals? Oh, absolutely, because we're, we're not going to support a Conservative government. Turns out it's not so simple. Do you think that comment was premature? Well, my position is this. Uh, we've got, uh, that, that was not my position. My position is this. We uh, have a number of priorities. And uh, I want Canadians to know that they could vote New Democrat. <laughs> Elect New Democrats, he says, to push a progressive agenda, but not necessarily a formal coalition. Coalition or not, it opened a new attack for the Conservatives. Only a Conservative majority government can prevent a government with Justin Trudeau as the spokesman but the NDP calling the shots. And the only way to stop these conservative cuts is to vote Liberal. Because just like the NDP couldn't stop Stephen Harper or Doug Ford, they can't stop Andrew Scheer. Trudeau isn't ruling out working with Singh, but he isn't ruling it in. As a majority incumbent prime minister, he's avoiding what-if questions about minority. We are working hard to elect a progressive government and stop conservative cuts. <laughs> But voters may not let him do that much longer. The polls suggest the minority is the most likely outcome, as Trudeau's Liberals fight a four-front war. They're battling the bloc in Quebec, the NDP in some cities, the Conservatives in most suburbs, and disappointment within the Liberal base. So a push in this final week, as big a crowd as possible in as many towns as possible to show momentum, create motivation, and try to save their majority. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. So as Andrew Scheer dished out his warnings in Winnipeg about the dangers of a left-wing coalition, he was also the target of some voter anger. It's because that city, and indeed the province, is under a state of emergency. Katie Simpson was there. <laughs> Forced from their homes with no idea when they can return. First Nations families huddled in the lobby of a downtown Winnipeg hotel, unsure of where they will spend the night. It's frustrating. This, that's my seat. Look at now they're sending a bus, like, shuffling us around like cattle. That's disgusting. That frustration only grew when evacuees found out Conservative leader Andrew Scheer was coming to that same downtown hotel as part of his election campaign. Do you think it's appropriate for someone to be campaigning at such a time in, in Manitoba? No, I don't think so. He should be helping out. If he wants a campaign, to help, he should help the people. Try dealing with the crisis instead of looking for votes. Given the state of emergency declared by both the city and the province, at least one federal leader decided to change his plans and not go to Manitoba at this time. It's important for the folks right now to focus on making sure everyone's safe and secure. That's their priority right now, and so we've made that decision. Sheer is standing by his choice. Our best wishes, our hearts are going out to those people who are affected uh, by the storm. And uh, we know that uh, the important work to uh, clean up afterwards and get power restored is underway. And we certainly hope that that happens as quickly as possible.
He says he also made a donation to the Red Cross, though he wouldn't say how much, nor would he say when he made the donation. I want to highlight the important work that the Red Cross is uh, doing to help with those families who are affected uh, by the storm uh, and uh, certainly don't want to disrupt the, the good work that they are doing. Sheer dismissed suggestions his visit was tone deaf and continued on with regularly scheduled campaign events, including a stump speech here at a curling rink. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now, believe it or not, not every election story is about conflict. There's also the utter joy of getting to cast a ballot after escaping a murderous regime. Greg Rasmussen met some former refugees from Syria who can now take part in Canada's democracy. Raise your right hand and please repeat after me. A transformation from Syrian refugee to Canadian with a vote. That I will be careful. And bear true allegiance. He shares the same name as Syria's dictator, but this Bashar al-Assad is worlds away. Thank you very much. Well done, yeah, sir. Yeah. I'm a Canadian now, yeah. <laughs> Today is my first day as a Canadian. Deciding who to vote for comes down to a couple of key issues. I'm caring about the environment, to be honest, and uh, economy, too. Thank you, appreciate it. At this advanced polling station, new Canadian Danny Ramadan is shocked at the number of people who don't bother to vote. People in Syria, 400,000, 500,000 people died because they wanted the simple right of voting. And you don't want to take 10 minutes of your day to go down and vote in a place? That's, that's, that's privilege. And I would really encourage you to change that mindset. A few minutes later... Wow. <laughs> it really felt amazing. That, that was... A moment to remember, I think. So how excited are you to be able to vote for the first time in a Canadian election? Amazing, you know. I... Another new Canadian voting for the first time, Mohamed Al Saleh, who researched the party's positions on climate change, housing and immigration. As a former refugee, um, Canada's immigration policy is something that saved my life and is something that saved my family's life. Inside the advance poll, he receives his first secret ballot. I'm voting for the first time ever. And makes his mark. Oh my God, this is amazing. I'm so happy. Um, for the first time, I see a ballot with different choices, and I get to vote secretly and then cast my own vote into the box. This is amazing. Democracy is awesome, and it's so empowering. A power held by every Canadian but with even more meaning for some. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Burnaby. It's a pretty cool story. Tomorrow night, the National will be back on the road and back in the 905, the seat-rich area that surrounds the city of Toronto. It's a battleground again in this election. We're checking in to see what voters are thinking in the 30 or so ridings up for grabs. Millions of people will be voting, and they tend to vote in a block. So winning there is key to winning the election. Our focus will be on the ridings of Milton and Burlington, where voters are struggling to decide in a campaign that has been full of surprises, safe to say. So less than a week to go. The National back in that key battleground. For now, though, it's over to you guys with the other news. All right, sounds good, Rosie. Uh, now, as you heard earlier, getting to the polls is maybe the least of many Manitobans' worries. Tens of thousands of homes and businesses there still without power, and some 30,000 trees knocked down in Winnipeg alone. As Cameron McIntosh tells us, the cleanup, big job. It's when you get up high that the damage caused is really clear. Power lines toppled, twisted, torn down by that sudden blast of winter. Selena Lesko is one of about 20,000 Manitobans outside of Winnipeg, getting by without power for a fourth straight day. I am bundled up. I have two pairs of pants on, a shirt, two hoodies, a jacket, a hat, sometimes my scarf. This Thanksgiving, dinner will be on the barbecue. I have a freezer full of food that's thawing out right now that I need to cook. So, you know, I still have a, a full tank of propane. So I'm still good. I, I'll be good for a couple more days. Hydro officials say it could take up to 10 days to get all of rural Manitoba powered up again. Meanwhile, here in Winnipeg, the power is mostly back on. It's the cleanup now that's the priority, and there's a lot of work to do. Debris like this is still strewn across roads and sidewalks all over the city. Cleaning it up could take days. City crews are on it. 
Others, like Roger Sargison, are taking matters into their own hands. That's his fifth trailer load. People couldn't move their cars, and some of them were leaning on the wires. and just had to pull it down. 3,300 First Nations evacuees have registered with the Red Cross in Winnipeg. Some are being put into the convention center in a temporary shelter. We completely understand shelter is not a comfortable place, um, but it's, it's what is available in this case. Meanwhile, as the weather starts to turn back towards normal, melting snow is turning into runoff. The flood channel around Winnipeg is open as a precaution, with the hope this early winter-like storm doesn't lead to a rare fall flood. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. In Syria tonight, the only thing more shocking than the fresh violence and misery is the rapid pace of events. So let's get up to speed. Until a few days ago, Syria's northeast was dominated by the U.S.-backed Kurds, allies in the fight against ISIS. But after Donald Trump signaled a U.S. withdrawal, Turkish forces shelled and shot their way into that territory with the stated goal to establish this zone of control along the border. Effectively abandoned by the Americans, the Kurds have incredibly turned to the Syrian regime for help. And so the regime has rapidly advanced from the south. Now a dangerous squeeze with both sides massing near the strategically important city of Manbij. Ms. Margaret Evans tells us from northern Iraq, more lives are being threatened and uprooted, caught between two advancing armies. One flag comes down. Another goes up. This is Tel Abiyad, a Syrian border town now controlled by Turkey and its proxy fighters, Syrian opposition militias helping to push the Kurds out. 50 kilometers to the south, more flags, these ones representing the Syrian regime and Bashar al-Assad, government forces invited in by a desperate Kurdish leadership, abandoned by the Americans and in search of new protectors. Under the deal, they're expected to move from Manbij in the west all the way to Derik in the east, a town next to the Iraqi border. We're just on the Syrian side of the border right now at the crossing, and what we're seeing is a steady stream of journalists and aid workers heading across the border towards northern Iraq. They know the Syrian army is coming this way and that this part of northern Syria is about to change hands in terms of control yet again. Today, just south of the border post, 184 Syrian refugees crossed at an unofficial border. They're now in the care of the UNHCR. Spokesman Rashid Hussein says they're preparing for a possible influx. I mean, UNHCR has a, the plan to respond to around 50,000 individuals in case of uh, need. It's not the first time northern Iraqi Kurds will have hosted their brethren fleeing violence in Syria. Margaret Evans, CBC News, on the Syrian-Iraqi border. Donald Trump's decision on Syria has done the impossible in Washington. It has unified Democrats and Republicans in their condemnation. Paul Hunter has the White House effort to regain some semblance of control over events and the conversation. As northern Syria sinks further into chaos, the backlash in the U.S. against Donald Trump grows. His order to pull U.S. troops from the region is widely viewed as key to allowing this to happen. What in God's name is this man doing? What is he doing to NATO? What is he doing? It is a shame. It's shameful. I hate seeing what I'm seeing on television with the, you know, yet more uh, killing and marauding of innocent people as a consequence of this one person decision. And it's not just Democrats. Senior Republican Senator Mitch McConnell, typically a Trump loyalist, today said he has grave concerns. This afternoon, Donald Trump countered critics in both parties, announcing sanctions on Turkish steel and a suspension of trade talks with Turkey. Turkey's action, said Trump in a statement, is precipitating a humanitarian crisis and setting conditions for possible war crimes. I am fully prepared, he continued, to swiftly destroy Turkey's economy if Turkish leaders continue down this dangerous and destructive path. The sanctions that were announced today will continue uh, and will worsen unless and until Turkey uh, 
embraces an immediate ceasefire, stops the violence, uh, and agrees to negotiate uh, a long-term settlement of the issues along the border between Turkey and Syria. Note critics, Trump now wants an end to something he himself allowed to happen. Meanwhile, back in Syria, the fear grows that all of it will now lead to a resurgence of ISIS, the very reason U.S. troops were in Syria in the first place. Said Trump today, a small footprint of U.S. troops will remain in the country's south in part to combat ISIS, but the rest, all of them, will be gone from the north within days. Never-ending wars, he tweeted, will end. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Okay, we're back in two minutes with these stories. A day of protests in Ukraine over the president's leadership and his plan to end a simmering conflict with Russia. We'll take you there. Plus a big reveal from Margaret Atwood and the Testaments, but even she couldn't write this ending. And just ahead, some Halifax residents have been waiting more than a month for this. The removal of a construction crane finally underway. That's coming up in a couple of minutes. Ukraine's president has said he would never betray his country. But thousands of people took to the streets of Kiev today, accusing him of doing just that. They're upset over a potential peace deal with Russia that could end a deadly conflict in Ukraine's east. Chris Brown is on the ground with the latest. Yelling no to capitulation, a wide mix of Ukrainian nationalists marched through the capital, Kyiv, registering the rising anger here that Ukraine's president may be about to cave in to Russia. Are you worried that Mr. Zelensky is going to capitulate? Uh, I think uh, he tried to do it, but we uh, don't uh, let him to do it. The fear that you hear over and over again is that Ukraine's president is too eager to sign a deal to end the war in the country's east, too eager for a deal on Russia's terms. The war against Russian-backed separatists in the Donbass region has killed 11,000 people over five years. The veterans who are out today say they don't want those deaths to be for nothing. Don't try to BS the Ukrainian people, warned this former special operations soldier named Andriy. Any agreement should be on our conditions. President Volodymyr Zelensky, who was at the front lines today handing out medals to soldiers, has agreed to a Russian-supported formula that troops from both sides should retreat, followed by monitored elections and then some kind of autonomy for eastern Ukraine. But many who live in that potential demilitarized zone, such as Natalia Zherbenko of Stanitsa Luganskaya, fear it's just a Russian ploy to control Ukraine. I have never believed Putin. The words of Russia's president mean nothing, she says. Political analyst Volodymyr Yermolenko believes the critics are correct to be worried. Of course, Ukraine wants peace, but not on Russian terms, meaning that Russia will create a kind of a semi-state inside Ukraine, which will influence Ukrainian politics. Ukraine's president won with a huge mandate just in March, and ending the war was his key promise. But clearly, many Ukrainians are now alarmed at what the cost might be of achieving that. Chris Brown, CBC News, in Kyiv. Okay, let's get to Ian in our Vancouver National Newsroom. He's watching developing stories for us. And Andrew, we're going to begin in Nova Scotia. More than a month after Hurricane Dorian swept through the province, an evacuation order in a part of Halifax has been partially lifted. <laughs> well, as you can hear, people were happy to see parts of a crane dismantled weeks after it collapsed during the windstorm. Nearby homes were evacuated, and officials declared a localized state of emergency. Some residents have been allowed back, but no official word on how much longer the cleanup will take. Former Prime Minister Stephen Harper has reportedly sparked an angry response from Beijing after comments he made during a trip to Taiwan. According to a report in the Globe and Mail, China has expressed strong dissatisfaction with Ottawa over the trip and comments that Mr. Harper made in Taipei criticizing China's economic model. Global Affairs Canada said it was not involved in the planning of the trip. And a Texas police officer who shot and killed a black woman inside her own home on Saturday has now been charged with murder. It's beyond me to begin to understand what kind of police force responds to a wellness call 
with the equivalent of SWAT. A Titania Jefferson was killed after police were looking into why the door to her home was open. A neighbor had called a non-emergency number. Body cam footage shows the officer shooting within seconds of seeing her through a window. The 28-year-old woman was reportedly playing video games with her 8-year-old nephew when she was shot. A series of search and rescue operations are going on right now in Japan in the wake of a deadly typhoon. I'll have more on that in 20 minutes. Okay, Ian, and just ahead, with the launch of a world tour and a new album, a conversation with Celine Dion about her music, her fans, and the secret to her success. I never wanted to have a hit. I wanted to have a career. <laughs> Near, far, wherever you are, tune into our interview with a Canadian icon. is the unstoppable Celine Dion launching her new world tour in Quebec City. That tour and her album are titled Courage and you're about to find out why. Dion has a lot going on right now but she carved out some time to sit down with Tom Power the host of CBC Radio's Q and one thing is for sure they had a lot of fun. So here is Tom with her story of stardom that just keeps going on. She's been on stage in front of crowds and cameras since she was 12 years old. What do you say? Seemingly born to capture an audience with hair-raising performances and that voice. There's nothing I'll be, and I know. With an epic list of gigantic power ballads, Celine Dion went on to become one of the highest selling artists of all time. To escape, the city was sticky and cool. And in 2003, when playing shows in Las Vegas wasn't exactly the coolest thing you could do, with a record-breaking residency, A New Day, she single-handedly made Vegas cool again. More than a thousand shows later, and three years after the death of her longtime manager and husband, Rene Angelil, Céline has left Vegas and started a new chapter. Cause I got my own I mean, there's no denying Celine Dion is having a moment right now. It's even got a name. The Selinaissance. The longtime pop diva, now a fashion icon, is connecting with a generation of fans who weren't even born when Titanic came out. I mean, she practically shuts down every social media site as soon as she puts up a photo. Fans are taking all of Celine's Instagram photos and turning them into memes. Courage, don't you dare. And now, Courage. That's the title of her upcoming album and world tour, but it's also a word that's come to define her outlook on life. I recently caught up with Céline Dion in Montreal to get into all of it. Here we go, Roy. How's it going? I'm doing very well. How about you? Good. Welcome to the show. Thanks a lot for doing this. Well, thank you for flying to oh, Montreal. Oh, come on. I mean, I'd, I'd crawl. Oh, come on, come on. Don't get me started. Uh, I want to just. I want to start by going back a little bit, and I want to go back to June eighth, twenty nineteen, your final residence show, okay. in in Vegas, and you walk out on stage and you open the show with "Power of Love" as you kind of did every single night. But on the last night that you did it, when you walked out, and you knew it was going to be your last night doing this show. What did you feel in that moment? I felt very strong when I did the last show, even though there was a lot of butterflies going on, I did not want to um, cry, which um, it's easy for me to cry because I'm very emotional, passionate, mm. and I care and I love what I do. Mm. And I get, when I get embraced by the audience, I. I I get taken by the emotions, and I didn't want to just cry. I just wanted to say, hey, last show, yeah. I'm so happy. So many people came, and we're still here tonight, 
and I'm about to hit the road. I, I love that you said that when I, when I, um, you said it's hard for me not to cry because I take in so much of what the, because I thought it would be because of the content of the songs, but also because you see what the audience is reacting to these songs, because these songs mean an awful lot to an awful lot of people, you know? They listen to them yes. at births and, and deaths and, and, and birthdays and all these sort of moments. Like, do you, do you take some time at a concert to kind of like look around and see how these songs that you sang? That's all they, I do actually, without, I don't want to interrupt no, please, you. please, please. It's just that, um, you know, years, year after year, pretty much like for 20 something years, uh, some less, some a little more, but um, I've been singing some of those songs, a lot of those songs, if I can uh, rephrase that, uh, night after night. And many times in interviews, they've asked me, aren't you tired of singing the same songs all over My heart again? Will go on or something and like sometimes that, yeah. Yeah. I have to admit to you and say, oh, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard because you have to make this song tonight like you've sing, sing it for the first time. Why? Because those people that are in the audience tonight, it might be their favorite. So when I start the song that I think, that I might think that I don't want to sing it, they change it automatically and it's like the first time, every time. Believe it or not, they make it happen. Can we talk about this new record? I just got to hear a little bit of it. And I, I did want to talk a little bit. I know we can't talk that much about it. But, you know, Celine, the, the word courage stuck out to me. You know, it's, it's the name of the tour, it's the name of the record, it's the name of the song that I just heard. I want to know what that word means to you. Well, it means that um, everybody is going through um, things in life. Um, things that we have to... Uh, I would say when something bad happens to you in life, you have to find a way to overcome these obstacles and find a way to find inner strength to say that's part of life. This is not something that you choose. This is something that is imposed to you by life. And it's up to you to go through uh, these obstacles and you have the options if you're going to need help or not, mm. or how you're going to go through this. Yeah. Uh, and we all do have good time, good moments and, and bad mom moments, and we all lose people. And saying that, uh, losing um, the father of my children, um, um, my husband, my manager, um, the person that I love the most, um, in the world, and um, the person that I can rely upon, and without questioning anything since I'm 12 years old. And I really believe that through all the years with Renee, who gave me so much, who taught me so much, who, mm -hmm. and I feel him through the eyes of my kids, and Inside of me, I felt very, very, very strong, probably stronger than ever before, mm. because I make decisions and I'm not scared. Before I was not part of meetings. It was, yeah. Renee was really, I don't want to say overprotecting me, but he was protecting me a lot because he wanted me to just, you sing the best you can. Yeah, I want you to enjoy, else, yeah. and I will. You don't need to do this. So, did you have to learn how to do that? Did you have to learn how to become a different I'm person? I'm still learning. Yeah. What did you it's have to learn? It's a learning process. Like, like what? What did you? I'm, I'm just curious. It's like it's like learning that um, the best is yet to come, and that you know what? I don't want that to sound pretentious, but I am courageous. You are, and I hope you know that that courage you give. And I hate to put this burden on you, but how your courageousness or your courage can help so many people. I mean, I, I know that's not lost on you. Well, I appreciate it. And if only that is what I need to do to go on stage and sing that song to help people. Yeah. I will do this for the rest of my life. And you, you can do it for the rest of your life because it seems like every single year there's a younger generation that falls deeply in love with your music all over again. And I don't understand that one. Are you familiar with this, the Selenaissance, they call it? The what? Selenaissance. 
Selena Sands. Selena Sands. Selena Sands. Which is, you know, where Drake, I like it. Drake wants to get your photo tattooed on his arm. Oh. No, he wants Please it. Please tell me it's a fake one. It's a fake one, but he wants it. Oh, but gosh, he, but, thank you. But, it, but there's, <laughs> there's something going on here, man. It's a thing. You're, you're, you're a meme. You're an internet icon right now. You're a, you know. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Don't make me blush. I don't know. But I mean, it, I, it, I'm happy I, about I it. See, I see. I see it. And it, it's, um, I don't know if it's because... I've done everything that needed to be done to have an international career because this is what I wanted. I don't need to prove to my family, my friends, the industry, myself anymore. Yeah. I, I did that. Yeah. Okay, I, they gave me a, a spot. Mm -hmm. I took it. And I'm, I never wanted to have a hit, I wanted to have a career. I went to school, learned English, tried things, and Right now, it's like, am I scared to, to fail? I don't even consider failure or failing. Is that some things will not work as much as other things. Some people will comment on more clothing. This is my favorite. I didn't like that. Mm. I prefer this hair. I don't like that okay, one. Okay. She said, um, you, but like I said before, you can't please everybody. No, you're right. All I know is that I go to... You have to assume yourself. I go to a karaoke night, and pe oh! people who are 22 get up and do That's the Way It Is. I, oh, that's nice. That's my, that's my I, favorite I wanted, song. I would love song. to go there, because I love to sing so much. Listen, next time you're in Toronto, give me a call. You know, we'll figure it out. I figured it out. <laughs> I have so many songs that every word you're going to say, I have a song. Uh, Devil. I'm just trying to think of words that you could sing. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I would just think of this, but I don't know why that says it. Where do you live, Toronto? Bye! I don't know. That, that was, joking. That's the last word. That's the first word that came to my mind when you Tell said Sandy Tell me you took word. a picture of that. I want a copy of it. I think that should be the new album cover. <laughs> of my so new album cover is, 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 is <laughs> giving, me, giving, me, giving me the finger. Can I do a banjo version of That's the Way It Is? Oh. I can read your mind. mind. And you should have brought story. it. We could have done it together. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet Thanks you. Thanks for doing this. Thank you so Remember much. It's joy. nice to meet yeah, you. Thank you so much. Do that version. I would love to hear that. I'm gonna, I'll work it up when I get home. Okay. When you want it to, there's no easy way out. B flat, C major. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, I can make that happen. Any key works. Whatever. Make it your own. Okay. Two things. Yeah. Number one, Celine Dion gave you the finger. This is a family news. Oh, guys. my God. It was terrifying. I mean, in those 0.8 seconds that I've, I've never been so scared in my life, but then she followed it up with a high five. I still don't really know why the word devil was the first word that came to mind. I don't know what that says about my Rorschach test, but I feel pretty good about it. <laughs> Second thing is, it's, it's a little hard not to notice a banjo. So having missed the opportunity, this is your MO now, you just take the banjo to every TV encounter? It's in my contract now. The CBC stipulates that I have it with me at all times. Do. I'm going to be doing Hee Haw with Mark Kearney a little <laughs> bit later on. I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be all right. Did you figure out the song? I figured out a little bit of it, yeah. I'll play a little okay. bit of it. Could she resist? I know, right? So we put up the whole version of the video, of me playing the whole thing, singing a bit of it. It's up on our YouTube channel. It's up on Facebook and, and Instagram. It did really well for us, yeah. uh, but I hope she gets to see it. I know it's been sent her way. And if she doesn't, Celine Dion, you can always come here to the National. Tom will do it for you in person. You got it. I mean, I'd be, my, my pleasure. I think I'm the first banjo player on the National. We will check the archives. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Adrian. Okay, coming up, the family who helped hide Edward Snowden say they are newly afraid. How the violence in Hong Kong is making precarious lives even more vulnerable. The protests in Hong Kong have been weekend fixtures since June, but today, an unusual Monday rally and a new call for help from the United States. It comes after a weekend of increased violence. A police officer was stabbed, a small bomb exploded. And a sharp warning came from the Chinese president. Attempts to divide China would end in, quote, crushed bodies and shattered bones. Now, in the chaos are people trying very hard to stay out of harm's way. One family in particular, asylum seekers, who've been expecting acceptance into Canada any day now, 
They are at special risk because of where they are and who they once helped. We met up in Hong Kong not long ago. It wasn't the plan to end up in the middle of Hong Kong's protests, and Supun Kalapata, who took the cell phone video, didn't go looking for trouble. It found him. Day by day, it's developed violence and uh, discriminations. As precarious as Hong Kong life has been, it's arguably worse for them. You're more unsafe now than yes. you were. Yes, before uh, more unsafe. Sapun and his partner have been in limbo for over a decade. Not only because Hong Kong accepts fewer than 1% of refugee claimants, but they've been targeted because of their generosity. They are the asylum seekers who hid famed American whistleblower Edward Snowden back in 2013. Thank you. This is Ed. Around the time the Snowden movie was released, Supun's identity was exposed and they were pursued. Immediately denied refugee status, forbidden from working, the youngest denied access to school, and all cut off from a meager allowance. Now human rights advocates are newly worried about this family. They just live in horrible, horrible status because the police are not uh, entirely acting according to law. And of course, when they're already that vulnerable, now is a moment more vulnerable to them. There's another oddity. In the spring, Canada accepted two members of the family, Supun's daughter, Kiana, and her mom, Vanessa. I feel like, oh, this is my second home that gave me a big chance to change my life. I cannot believe that I'm here right now. But the whole family had applied and completed background checks at the same time. Did you believe you would all be able to get there? I think we can go all same flight all together. Yet suddenly there was silence. Now the family is split and the kids confused. And then Situmdi, uh, now we start to do compare with uh, her life and Kiana life because they are talking each other in the phone always. Then Situmdi, Kiana show her room and then her toys and then the outside the window, her um, environment, everything. Then Situmdi asked me, why, mommy, I don't have? When we asked him last spring, Edward Snowden felt he knew why the remaining refugees who helped him weren't brought to Canada too. I believe, and everyone else believes, the only reason this process for admission has taken so long is simply because the Canadian government's bending over backwards not to create an appearance that might irritate the United States government. Because helping the people who helped you might look like Canada is helping a man the United States considers to be a traitor? Uh, right, that, that's what they would say. The family's Canadian lawyers say they cannot get an explanation for the delay from the government. CBC News can't either. And with the election seven days away, faith fades. And still to come, a Thanksgiving moment. Because while lots of folks probably expected drop-in visitors today, this may not have been what folks in Calgary had in mind. I'm Chris Berube, and tomorrow on the CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, many Canadians are being asked to choose between their head and their heart this election. On a new edition of Please Explain, we'll talk all about strategic voting and our electoral system. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to the National Newsroom in Vancouver. We're watching a developing story in Japan where a search and rescue operation is underway in the wake of a powerful typhoon. A dozen people reportedly still missing following the weekend storm and crews are desperate to find them. Authorities say nearly 60 people are confirmed dead. That includes a woman in her 70s. She was accidentally dropped from a rescue helicopter and fire officials say she wasn't strapped in properly. Signs of progress for a Brexit deal as talks continue today between the European Union and the United Kingdom. The deal is possible, and it's possible this month. It may even be possible this week, um, but we're not there yet. EU leaders will have a final meeting later this week to try to hammer out an agreement ahead of the October 31st deadline. If they're able to work out a deal, it would still need to be passed by the UK Parliament, probably in a rare Saturday session, and that would be no small feat given how deeply divided it's been on this issue. And for just the second time ever, the Nobel Prize for Economics has been awarded to a woman. There are not enough women in the economic profession uh, at all levels.
Esther Duflo is one half of a husband and wife duo who will share the prize with a third U.S. economist. At 46 years old, she's the youngest person to win the honour. The Royal Swedish Academy of Science says Duflo and her husband, Abhijit Banerjee, helped pioneer new ways to fight global poverty. Their focus is on specific issues like education and child health. And speaking of awards, the judges of the prestigious Booker Prize ripped up the rule book tonight. Margaret Atwood is celebrating, but in a plot twist, there's something new. That's next. Battle of the Blades, Thursdays on CBC and CBC Gem. Margaret Atwood's new novel has received many accolades, including being shortlisted for the Booker Prize before it was even available on bookshelves. Well, tonight, the winner of that prestigious award was announced, but as Ellen Morrow explains, it wasn't quite as expected. On one of the literary world's biggest nights, a plot twist from the judges. There are two winners of this year's Booker Prize. British author Bernadine Everisto and Canadian Margaret Atwood. It would have been quite embarrassing um, for me, a, a good Canadian, because we, we don't do famous, we think it's in bad taste. Uh, it would have been embarrassing if I had been alone here. The prize has only been split twice before, and current rules say there should only be one winner. But this year, the judges said they just couldn't decide. Not only that, each author made history of her own. Everisto is the first black woman to win, and Atwood, at 79, is now the oldest recipient. I would have thought that I would, be, would have been um, too elderly. Uh, <laughs> and I, I kind of don't need um, the attention. She certainly has plenty of it. The Testaments has sold a quarter of a million copies in just a month. There is no resistance. It's the sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, now one of streaming's most popular shows. In both novels, women are subjugated. Handmaids have become commonplace at political protests in the U.S. amidst the reinvigorated abortion debate. There have been scenes from real life that could have been right out of the Hulu MGM uh, Handmaid's Tale series in which in a line of men in, in dark suits is, is signing laws um, about women's bodies. Atwood plans on donating her share of the prize to a scholarship for Indigenous students in environmental studies. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. Just ahead, it being Thanksgiving, we wanted to do something to mark the occasion. And then we learned residents of Windsor, Ontario have been watching for the Wild Bunch. The moment is next. on the new episode of 22 Minutes. Take that, Newfoundland. Like this powerful yard rake from Black & Decker. Wouldn't call a rake powerful. Okay. Tuesday at 8.30 on CBC and CBC Gem. I've got a cellmate that eats people's faces. Well, more than a few Canadians might be letting their belts a little out tonight after all that Thanksgiving feasting, but not every big plump bird came from a supermarket this weekend. A couple of Canadian cities have welcomed some colorful new feathered friends. And considering the holiday, you got to give them marks for bravery. Let's talk turkey in tonight's moment. <laughs> Wild turkey encounters in Walkerville. Someone should make a movie. Well, if this keeps up, they'll have plenty of footage to work with. Windsor, Ontario's Elaine Weeks has been following a family of wild turkeys that recently moved in to the neighborhood. And they've been coming up our street and they just kind of hang out. They pack here and there and they're wandering around looking for good things to eat. Now, wild turkeys are apparently among the smarter birds out there, but <laughs> roaming around on Thanksgiving weekend, maybe not the brightest of ideas. I, I didn't know why Thanksgiving giving dinner would walk right up to my doorstep. And Calgary, also seeing a gang of wild turkeys. As far as we know, none of these guys has ended up on a dinner plate this weekend. But you never know. Although, 
I will say, and I, and I only just learned this today, mm -hmm. that, that wild turkeys apparently can run really fast, like something like 40 kilometers an hour, and the wild variety can, can fly even faster than that. So, so catching them, no easy feat. Yeah, something like 80 kilometers an hour is the mm. speed at which they can fly. Uh, listen, I'm not going to go all poll tracker on you, but I did an unofficial survey of the newsroom here in Vancouver. No one has ever eaten wild turkey. And I don't think you guys have either, right? Yeah. So, yes, we're talking wild turkeys, and yes, it is Thanksgiving Monday, but really, I don't think there really was any threat that mm. any of these turkeys might have ended up on a dinner plate. Yeah, I, I got nothing. Uh, <laughs> like, I'm not surprised. I did lo learn tonight that they don't, uh, they don't migrate at all and that people in Windsor have been told to hide their bird feeders to stop them from hanging around. But I, I wouldn't mind seeing them <laughs> hanging around. Anyway, that is the National for this Monday, October 14th. Good night. Good night. All right.